For a long time, Lu Qingmin was alone. Her older sister worked at a factory in Shenzhen, a booming industrial city an hour away by bus. Her friends from home were scattered at factories up and down China's coast, but Min, as her friends called her, was not in touch with them. It was a matter of pride because she didn't like the place she was working. She didn't tell anyone where she was. She simply dropped out of sight. Her factory's name was Karen Electronics. The Hong Kong owned company made alarm clocks, calculators, and electronic calendars that displayed the time of day in cities around the world. The factory had looked respectable when Min came in for an interview in March 2003. Tile buildings, a cement yard, a metal accordion gate that folded shut. It wasn't until she was hired that she was allowed inside. Workers slept 12 to a room in bunks crowded near the toilets. The rooms were dirty and they smelled bad. The food in the canteen was bad too. A meal consisted of rice, one meat or vegetable dish, and soup, and the soup was watery. A day on the assembly line stretched from eight in the morning until midnight. 13 hours on the job plus two breaks for meals and workers labored every day for weeks on end. Sometimes on a Saturday afternoon, they had no overtime, which was their only break. The workers made 400 yuan a month, the equivalent of $50, and close to double that with overtime, but the pay was often late. The factory employed a thousand people, mostly women, either teenagers just out from home or married women already past 30. You could judge the quality of the workplace by who was missing. Young women in their 20s, the elite of the factory world. When Min imagined sitting on the assembly line every day for the next 10 years, she was filled with dread. She was 16 years old. From the moment she entered the factory, she wanted to leave, but she pledged to stick it out six months. It would be good to toughen herself up and her options were limited for now. The legal working age was 18, though 16 and 17 year olds could work certain jobs for shorter hours. Generally only an employer that freely broke the labor law, the very blackest factories men called them, would hire someone as young as she was. Her first week on the job, Min turned 17. She took a half a day off and walked the streets alone, buying sweets and eating them by herself. She had no idea what people did for fun. Before she had come to the city, she had only a vague notion of what a factory was. Dimly, she thought it as a lively social gathering. I thought it would be fun to work on the assembly line, she said later. I thought it would, would be a lot of people working together, busy, talking, and having fun. I thought it would be very free, but it was not that way at all. Talking on the job was forbidden and carried a five yuan fine. Bathroom breaks were limited 10 minutes and required a sign-up list. Min worked in quality control, checking the electronic gadgets as they moved past on the assembly line to make sure buttons worked and plastic pieces joined and batteries hooked up as they should. She was not a model worker. She chatted constantly and sang with the other women on the line. Sitting still made her feel trapped, like a bird in a cage, so she frequently ran to the bathroom just to look out the window at the green mountains that reminded her of home. Dongguan was a factory city set in the lush subtropics, and sometimes it seemed that Min was the only one who noticed. Because of her, the factory passed a rule that limited workers to one bathroom break every four hours. The penalty for violations or violators was five yuan. After six months, Min went to her boss, a man in his 20s, and said she wanted to leave. He refused. Your performance on the assembly line is not good, said Min's boss. Are you blind? Even if I were blind, Min countered, I would not work under such an ungrateful person as you. She walked off the line the next day in protest, an act that brought in a hundred yuan fine. The following day, she went to her boss and asked again to leave. His response surprised her. Stay through the Lunar New Year, New Year holiday, which was six months away, and she could quit with the two months back pay that the factory owed her. Min's boss was gambling that she would stay. Workers flood factory towns like Dongguan after the new year, and competition for jobs then is the toughest. After the fight, Min's boss became nicer to her. He urged her several times to consider staying. There was even talk of a promotion to a factory floor clerk, though it would not bring an increase in pay. Min resisted. Your factory is not worth wasting my whole youth here, she told her boss. She signed up for a computer class at a nearby commercial school. 
When there wasn't an overtime shift, she skipped dinner and took a few hours of lessons in how to type on a keyboard or fill out forms by computer. Most of the factory girls believed they were so poorly educated that taking a class wouldn't help, but Min was different. Learning is better than not learning, she reasoned. She phoned home and said she was thinking of quitting her job. Her parents, who farmed a small plot of land and had three younger children still in school, advised against it. You always want to jump from this place to that place, her father said. Girls should not be so flighty. Stay in one place and save some money, he told her. Min suspected that this was not the best advice. Don't worry about me, she told her father. I can take care of myself. She had two true friends in the factory now, Liang Rong and Hong Jiao, who were both a year older than Min. They washed Min's clothes for her on the nights she went to class. Laundry was a constant chore because the workers had only a few changes of clothes. In the humid, dark nights after the workday ended, long lines of girls filed back and forth from the dormitory bathrooms carrying buckets of water. Once you had friends, life in the factory could be fun. On rare evenings off, the three girls would skip dinner and go roller skating, and then return to watch a late movie at the factory. As autumn turned into winter, the cold and the unheated rooms kept the girls awake at night. Min dragged her friends into the yard to play badminton until they were warm enough to fall asleep. In 2004, the Lunar New Year fell in late January. Workers got only four days off, not enough time to go home and come out again. Min holed up in her dorm and phoned home four times in two days. After the holiday, she went to her boss again, and this time he let her leave. Liao Rong and Huang Jiao cried when Min told, her, told them her news. In a city of strangers, they were the only ones who knew about her departure. They begged her to stay. They believed that conditions at other factories were no better, and that to leave or to stay would be the same in the end. But Min did not think so. She promised she would return for a visit after she got paid at her new job. Min left the same day with a few clothes and a backpack and the two months' wages that the factory owed her. She did not take her towels and bedding with her. Those things had cost money, but she couldn't bear the sight of them anymore. In 10 months on the assembly line, Min had sent home 3,000 yuan, about $360, and made two true friends.